May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Coach Shaw always asked a lot from his cross-country runners. <clears throat> coach Shaw was my cross-country coach in high school. His workouts were hard. Now, the high school I went to is settled up in the foothills of Northern California, a very pretty place. That also means that my high school was surrounded with old wagon trails, people coming from east to west during the 1800s for the gold rush. And that means that they turned a lot of these wagon trails that go up hills and down hills, and then up hills again and down hills again, into actual roads. Roads, right? Like there's pavement on them, but can you get two cars by each other? Probably not. One's going down the side of the hill, and one's scraping the side of the hill. That's where we did our workouts. So you've heard of those things called hill days, right? Work hill day is like really tough. Every day was a hill day for us, even if it wasn't a hill day. Coach Shaw would give us easy workout days, right? Like three or four miles. And we'd have really hard days, like seven or eight miles. And if he was feeling sorry for us, he'd say, oh, we'll just go on the track, right? Because the track is flat and we do sprints. But they weren't sprints. They were distance sprints around the track. And on top of all of that, you know, cross-country season happens in the fall when it's hot and it's dry and there's no wind and it's also hot. <laughs> Now, in order to get us ready for competition, Coach Shaw made us endure disciplined workouts. In order to get you and I ready for hardship and difficulty in our lives, God tells us in Hebrews 12, to endure the Father's discipline looking to Jesus. Our reading from Hebrews 12 builds on Hebrews chapter 11, the verses that came before it in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 lists many Old Testament believers. There's a long list of people who came in the Old Testament who endured discipline and hardship and difficulties in their lives from God. But because they held on to God's promises, they endured. However, they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on the earth. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The people that are listed in Hebrews 11 faced difficult situations in their lives. Days that would have brought many people to just give up. To stop holding on to God's promises. To demand that God make some of those promises come true now. Promises of peace and abundance and good relationships. Most people would have given up on holding God to his promises because their lives were so difficult. Yet the people listed did not give up. But they endured those difficult situations. Recognizing that their hope in God and his promises with the promise of a better life to come. He talks about a city that he prepared for them. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about eternal life. This is what they held on to. And that's the foundation that Hebrews chapter 12 builds on. Hebrews 12 begins like this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... Again, referring back to those listed from the Old Testament in Hebrews 11. Those that endured hardship, but held on to God's promises. Because we're surrounded by them, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Sin weighed down the believers of the past. And they constantly fought that battle to throw those things off. Throw off doubt. Throw off Fear, throw off anxiety, even give up their hometowns, give up wealth, give up their jobs, give up their friends, give up their family relationships. 
Anything that hurt their faith and their relationship with God was to be thrown off so they could run that race towards God. So they could keep the faith. You and I must throw off the same things. Things in our lives that are not good. Things that are good at clinging to us. Things that are good at surrounding us and weighing us down. Things that are good at hurting our relationship with God. Those things, God says, get rid of those things in your lives. Those same difficulties as the great cloud of witnesses endure affect us. Whether it is something like rejection. Moses was rejected twice from Egypt. They kicked him out twice. Whether there's something in your life that is making you be patient. If patience is learned by waiting a long time for something, maybe you've waited a long time for this thing that is good. And you wonder why God has not allowed that thing to happen to you. Sarah and Abraham waited decades for a guaranteed promise that God gave to them of a son. Maybe it's anger, an argument, or jealousy with someone in your own family, maybe even your own sister or brother. Abel was killed by Cain because he was jealous. God's people face difficulties in this world. But Hebrews 12, verse 7 says, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. So the fact that you face difficult days and hardships, probably not a surprise to all of you. But to understand that God treats his children with discipline may be a revelation to you. The fact that you face discipline, difficulties in your lives, means you are one of God's people. God shares this insight with us so that we don't ignore hardship in our lives and so that we don't become overcome by it and just give up. We hear that we must be disciplined by God as our Father. Because if you are not disciplined, and again, everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate. You're not true sons and daughters. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? You are God's child by faith, and so you will be disciplined by your God. That discipline is not easy. Discipline is the hard journey that we must endure as God's children. Endure is used four times in our reading from Hebrews 12. Now that Greek word, when we translate it into English as endure, the Greek word really is two words put together. It means to remain under. We try to think of a, a picture in our minds of what that looks like. You can think about somebody lifting weights. Their arms remain under the bar as they lift the weight up. You could also think of it as a mother whose arms remained under her child all night, as that baby cries all night, but the mother lifts that child up and holds the child. You probably think back to some scenes that you've seen over the last week. You can think about a search and rescue personnel, and they hold their arm up, they have a flashlight, and they're looking for victims, for survivors from the hurricane. Endurance, when we hear that word in this text, has two pictures. It's something that is pushing down on us, and then we are also pushing up on it. Endurance is hard then. And endurance becomes even harder when we hear the words of Jesus from our gospel lesson from Luke 12. Jesus said, do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division." From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other. Three against two, two against three. They will be divided. Father against son, son against father. Mother against daughter, daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. 
Jesus shares this insight with us so that we understand why there are divisions in this world. See, Jesus came into this world to make peace between us and God. So we would have that lasting relationship with him. But that also means that causes division between those that have peace with God, that believe in God, and those that do not. There is not peace between believer and unbeliever in this world. And Jesus says that even affects families. And I'm not going to go into examples of how that can affect families because I know you know what that's like. I can look around and I know all of you have experienced difficulties and hardships and division in your family. God's discipline comes to us when those that do not believe in him reject us because of our faith. And they make life hard for us because of our faith. But discipline also comes when God punishes us when we turn against our faith. When we go against him, then we face hardship in this world. And in each case, it would be very easy to allow that to overwhelm us, to give up on God. But he calls us to endure. Well, at this point, I imagine that you're hoping that we'll find some good news in this text. That there is some good news for us. That says there is good news. That you have been called to endure discipline, but you are not alone. Now, I don't wake up every morning and pray that God would make my day difficult. I remember growing up as a kid, I didn't wake up every day just hoping that my parents would ground me. In fact, often when I pray, I pray that God would take difficulties away from my life. I don't pray that God would allow difficulty and his discipline to come into my life. I don't pray that it would pile up so I have even more to hold up underneath to endure. But as I read what God tells us here in Hebrews, it seems like I am not praying how God wants me to. I'm not saying that you can't ever ask God to take difficulties away. Don't. It's not a takeaway from today. You can pray that God would take things away from you. But consider also what God says. And let us run with endurance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When Jesus came to this world, he knew what was coming for him. He knew the pain of the cross was in his future. He knew he would be rejected. He knew he would be beaten. But he also knew the joy waiting for him. That after his death, he would return to heaven. That he would again experience the joys of heaven. Jesus did not turn away from that difficult path to the cross. It's that he endured it to give you and I the victory. He endured. Be that pioneer and perfecter of our faith. To be the first one who would die and be raised. To be the one that we put our confidence in, that he will raise us too to new life. To be with him forever in heaven. You face discipline as one of God's children by faith, but you are not alone. You already have the victory of eternal life through Jesus. You have it. It's done. It's finished. This means that you can pray to God. For him to take away difficult things in your life. And he has the power to do that. But you can also pray for endurance. When difficulty and hardship are not taken away from you. You can pray that prayer with confidence. Understanding that perhaps God is disciplining you to bring him closer to you. So that you would not be tied to the things of this world. But you would be tied to him. And his good promises for you. Our faith gives us the perspective that Jesus was rejected in this world, who was disciplined by his Father. 
And because you and I are God's children, because you and I have faith, the world will reject us, and we will face discipline and hardship as well. And God knows that's difficult. He says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Enduring discipline is hard, but it ends with victory. Looking to Jesus' victory, we endure discipline willingly then. It's not like we just go through this life moping around as Christians, but we willingly endure discipline. Again, because we have that faith that looks at what Jesus has endured for us, that we already have victory through him. In our reading from Jeremiah 23, we see the distinction between what a life looks like that holds on to Jesus and a life that holds on to the lies of this world. Let the prophet who has a dream recount the dream. Let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer? That breaks a rock in pieces. The picture here reveals a difference between God's word and the dreams and the lies in this world. It says very clearly that there will be those in this world, preachers even, teachers, famous people, respected people in the eyes of the world, even your own friends and family, that will come up with lies. That will believe things that are not in God's word. That will reject you because you reject those lies and you hold on to the word. You reject the lies of this world. And so you willingly hold on to Jesus and his victory. The truth is, there will always be false prophets that speak against God's word. The temptation to believe them will always be there. The temptation to stop enduring discipline and just give in will always be there for you every day of your life. And the temptation to hold back the truths of the Bible in how you live and how you talk will always be there for you. But God calls us to be faithful to his word. His message to us in the Bible is a message of life. A surprise that we hold on to. A prize that we get not because we have run the race, but because Jesus ran the race for us. God's word is what will survive on the last day of this world. It will survive that fire of purification. When all things are made new, God's word will endure. His word is what we hold on to. It will break apart the lies of this world, exposing unbelief and death will not fail you because it is Jesus' victory. He endured what you could not. Jesus endured the full wrath of God. He endured what it felt like not to have peace with God so that you would have peace. You have peace now in Jesus because your sins are forgiven. You have peace now because God loves you. God loved his own son. And he loves you as his sons and daughters. You have peace now because eternal life is yours. There's a place waiting for you in heaven that is guaranteed. Jesus went there to prepare it for you, and he will come back to take you, to be with him there forever. There is nothing that can change that. There is nothing that can change that. Coach Shaw demanded a lot from his runners. His workouts were hard. But I got through them looking to him. See, every day Coach Shaw would wake up for us, before school started for us, before his job, and he would run in the mornings. Then he'd come to practice, and whatever he gave us to do for practice, he would do with us. You could tell he cared about running, but more than that, you could tell that he cared about us. 
He was a good runner. He actually made it to the Boston Marathon a few times. And if you're familiar with running, that's, that's a pretty big deal. God calls you sons and daughters. And so he disciplines you in this life. He knows that it's not easy. And he knows that you have difficulties right now. He knows that some of those won't go away until you cross that finish line. And he knows it will be hard. And he says this, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And he's saying consider Jesus. Consider him, yes, as an example that did not give up, but more than that, consider that he did not give up for you. That when God calls you to have endurance when he disciplines you is not something that you well up inside of yourself. The strength of endurance comes from faith in him. Reliance on him is what allows you to get through things. Reliance on his victory is what allows you to endure discipline. And he has such good things waiting for you. Because there's peace between you and God. No, you don't have all those things now, but you will one day through endurance. Mm -hmm. And so I pray that God is with you as you endure your Father's discipline, looking to Jesus. Not just for his example, but for what he has given you. That prize of eternal life in heaven. Amen. Amen.